All right. Thank you all so much for attending today. I'm really excited about our webinar. Um, we've got two amazing uh, ladies who are really pioneering the tutoring core model. Um, just to, before I get into it, I want to give a quick plug to our Community Tutoring Partnership Summit um, that we held back in mid-March. Uh, we had um, amazing panelists, and the summit was attended by leaders spanning 18 states, 39 higher education institutions serving hundreds of districts nationwide. Um, if you'd like to see the videos, please visit our summit page after today's talk. Um, the link should be now in the chat. High Impact Tutoring. Uh, is the clear evidence-based winner on how to best address the many challenges our students are facing related to learning loss. And as we think about the hurdles to do the right thing by our students, supplying the country with effective tutors is critical. It's really our mission and will continue to be our mission to make K-12 an, an, an experience that includes tutoring for any student that needs it. Um, one of the community tutoring program models that is showing a great deal of promise is called a tutoring core. And I'm sure most of you have heard about uh, the concept of a tutoring core, but if you're not familiar, typically funded by the state government, tutoring cores are designed to improve academic outcomes for struggling students with a focus on low-income families or communities underrepresented in politics. And so tutors in a state tutoring program are typically college students or recent graduates um, providing one-to-one -one or small group tutoring in math and reading. Of course, there's always a focus on early math and early reading. And mentorship and guidance are also sometimes offered through the program to help students improve their study skills, increase motivation, and set academic goals. Our two guests today represent two states, respectfully. Ashley Binken with the New Jersey Tutoring Corps and Lindsay Calhoun with the Arkansas Tutoring Corps. Ashley is the Chief Operating Officer with the New Jersey Tutoring Corps. She attended Rollins College where she was a two-sport athlete. I would definitely want to talk to you more about that. And completed her honors psychology thesis on quality out-of-time programming through the Central Florida YMCA. When weighing the options of a master's in public policy at American University or Teach for America, Ashley chose TFA, which is awesome. After five years of teaching middle school ELA and social studies in North Philadelphia and earning her master's from UPenn GSE, Ashley joined the New Jersey Department of Education. And over the course of her time there, she impacted the following areas of policy and practice, recruitment, preparation and recognition, data reporting and visualization. And as the director of strategic operations, she led the internal efforts to systematically improve the agency. Now the New Jersey Tutoring Corps provides tutoring services to scholars in grades pre-K through eight throughout the state. They began offering services in the summer of 2021 by partnering with Boys and Girls Clubs of New Jersey and the Y Alliance New Jersey, offering tutoring services during an eight week summer program on site at clubs or at the schools with which they partner for summer programs. And I know that that's evolved a bit and actually we'll talk a bit about that as well. Lindsay Calhoun currently serves as the director of the Education Renewal Zone ERZ at the University of Arkansas. Uh, the office of ERZ is responsible for identifying and developing programs that strengthen local schools and align with current state initiatives. In 2021, the ERZ founded the Arkansas Tutoring Corps I'll sometimes refer to that as the ATC, and the goal of the ATC is to help address the learning loss in students, grades K through eight in literacy, so you can see that correspondence of K through eight focus. Um, ATC has grown to over 800 active tutors serving students within the state of Arkansas, and the ATC has provided high school students an opportunity to offer tutoring and literacy to students in grades K through six within their district. So we're going to play, we're going to cover a couple of things because I really want our audience to understand that there are several ways that these programs get um, established and built, and there are several different design approaches. So we're going to start with um, what is the start story of each of these tutoring cores, how are they funded, and how did they move from idea or conception to implementation? Were the complexities running an evidence-based tutoring approach across multiple districts or community centers or both? and how do tutoring cores assess academic progress while building community value. And as we always do, we will end talking about the 2024 ESSER funding cliffs. It was the talk of both conferences that I just attended, and I'm sure it'll be the talk of the conference uh, next, next week in, um, at Stanford as well. And we wanna talk a bit about what the future looks like, especially for programs like this. So good morning to you both. I would love to start with you, Ashley. Um, can you tell us a bit about how the New Jersey Tutoring Corps got started 
and especially how you got involved. Yeah, absolutely. Really excited to be here today. I think um, I appreciate the opportunity to just talk about this because sometimes you forget, right? You you forget how it all began and then all the all the growth that's happened. So um, the Tutoring Corps was an idea driven by philanthropy initially in the state of New Jersey. The New Jersey Pandemic Relief Foundation was focused on a lot of like digital divide issues during the pandemic, um, access to food, um, uh, all those different services that we don't primarily think of education providing. Um, and so they were funding all of that. And as the end was wrapping up, they had a bunch of money left over and decided, you know what, we really need to shift gears and how can we invest in learning acceleration? So they partnered with the College of New Jersey, who was willing to kind of take that, that gamble and say, yeah, let's try this out. Um, Catherine Bassett is our CEO. She uh, she was at the helm and had about 24, 20, you know, 26 days uh, once they hired her at the College of New Jersey to stand up the first summer program. So it was quite a whirlwind that first year. Since then, um, we've become our own separate nonprofit to support the state so that we can partner with more higher ed pro providers. Um, we've expanded from what those community partners from that original, like very fast, very quick, how do we help find the most kids um, during the summer months to how do we support them all year long. So now we're in districts as well. And then, um, you know, continuing to, to leverage this three tiered kind of funding or not tiered three pronged funding model where we have state support from government from whether it's the governor's budget or, you know, department of education, district contributions, whether they be ESSER or other kind of recurring federal dollars. And then uh, philanthropy who is, you know, still an advocate for us in New Jersey. That's awesome. So Lindsay, I, I, your story as well is really interesting to me. I, I'm always kind of curious, you know, to see these types of programs, whether they start at a higher education institution or whether they are starting as a nonprofit and kind of get higher education involved. So as a director of the ERZ, um, what's the backstory founding the Arkansas Tutoring Corps? I'd love to hear like how those conversations started and how it became such a strong kind of initiative within the ERZ. Yes, yeah, so our tutoring board was really established um, through legislation, so it was Ag 912 in 2021, and it was to address um, learning loss in students in grades K-8 in literacy and math, and it called for us to provide readily and accessible trained tutors to those students. And so with ERZ, what ERZ is, is there are six offices of Education Renewal Zone. We're all housed at different higher education institutions across our state. And so our job is to really kind of bridge together Arkansas Department of Ed with higher education, specifically teacher prep programs and candidates serving K-12 schools. So kind of putting that triangle together. So when Tutoring Corps came about, it kind of naturally fell um, in our realm to establish. And so ours is really a group effort of the six of us starting this whole thing, sustaining it, maintaining it, and growing it as we went to, or as we went through. And so our tutoring core is uh, K-8 in literacy and math. It's really interesting. So like when, when sort of you got word that this thing was going to start, what was, what was the, I mean, what was the timbre of discussions? How did you, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm always curious because from tutoring program to tutoring program, the seed of those programs could be, you know, the state saying we need to establish this. This is the, this is the the um, office that needs to sort of represent it. But oftentimes when that's the case, everyone's kind of looking around and saying, okay, who's going to be, who's going to champion this? Who's going to actually, you know, think, think about overall holistic design, but also who's going to do that nitty gritty work that needs to be done, which is usually a lot of networking to make sure everybody's bought in. Yeah, I mean, the six of us, we literally came together at a big table <laughs> um, and just spent the, uh, the whole entire day just outlining options, what would work, what wouldn't work, talking to our schools, what would work, what would not work. Um, our, we have co-ops in Arkansas that serve um, all school districts, and so they're stationed throughout the state. So we talked to the math specialists, we talked to literacy specialists, um, and then really remembering that in the beginning, we were specifically a training program. So what training did tutors need in order to serve students effectively and just kind of vetted it out? Um, there were a lot of things that I would do differently. There were some lessons we learned the hard way, but really um, good, strong communication is what makes it successful. Yeah, in our summit, um, Susanna um, announced to the folks that, you know, the NSSA had just um, the National Student Support Accelerator had just released their toolkit for higher education. And, you know, there's so many pieces of that that 
are just based in the pioneering that your your kinds of institutions did in the beginning to sort of figure out what works and what doesn't work. So it's, it's just really interesting to see where that is now. So I'd love to learn more about general models that you use specifically. And we talked a bit about subjects and grades we focus on, but how you interact with the districts and your approach to learning, your conversations with principals and um, teachers. So I'd love to also to hear about your tutor resourcing in general. I know that there is one key piece, which is leveraging those university students, but outside of that, hearing a bit more about how you, you keep your numbers out and how you think about um, tenability of growing your program. So Ashley, how are things designed out in, um, in New Jersey? Sure, thanks. So, well, and quick shout out to Lindsay, because uh, hearing you describe sitting at that big, large table, it is, that takes the human power, right? To really convince people, hey, this is the right direction. And knowing everything you just said, Nate, that like, thankfully, Susanna and that team re did release all of those resources. Sometimes that's what it takes, right? To get all of those people really on, bought in and on board. So for us, I think it was really helpful and timely that around the same time that Catherine took on all of those resources were out. I had been advocating for this um, with a nonprofit I was supporting. And so I was well aware of just kind of the depth and breadth in their general outline. So what we do in New Jersey is follow the guidelines because like one, they're already vetted by evidence and research and two, if they work. Um, when we go in and we are working with the district though, I said the different approach that we have is that we're here to co-design our model with them. Um, I don't, it sounds very simple and obvious to me, but I don't know that others do that. So when you're, you know, in New Jersey, the very local design, local run, a lot of local ownership. So a, a one size fits all model will never work here for us. And so therefore, when we sit down and we say, here are the guidelines, right? Here are the, here are the, the, um, the minimum things that we have to do. What do you need? What does your school community look like? What does your schedule look like? Where are you investing already in different like pilot initiatives? How can we connect the dots and how, you know, how best to serve those, those kids? We also make sure that it's clear that our supports are our best for tier one and tier two students, right? So RTI and MTSS systems are, are by and large the like origination of personalized learning. And now if we can just kind of get it to reach everyone and, and, and make it affordable and timely and not just be on the backs of teachers, that's where we're coming in and saying, we're gonna push in our tutors to kind of support those classroom teachers, work alongside them and be that midway, you know, we're not interventionists. That's what you're saving your tier three, you know, kind of supports for those students, but we're coming in and academically focusing with those tier one and tier two kids. Um, and then by and large, that flexibility matters when it comes to those the like design parameters because sometimes an hour is what the district has, but they also need help and students need help in both content areas. So how are we leveraging technology? How are we are we really being mindful and saying, well, you know, 25 or 30 minutes of math, and then we switch over and do 25, 30 minutes of ELA within that hour time block. Now we can do both. Let's make sure the dosage is still there, right? So as schools are learning and adapting their structures in order for us to be successful, some of that flexibility has to be in place. And then we know like those are those goalposts though that we have to stay um, in alignment with. Yeah, it's so interesting because you have these evidence-based strategies and they either have evidence or emerging ev evidence in the, you know, in the TQIS. But it's often the case that you might have a very specific way that you want to do it based on your design. And it may differentiate from district to district. They may have completely different perspective. I was doing some reading last night and just, just generally reading about MTSS and looking at, you know, from state to state, how some states just think of it really differently. I think it was Oregon that literally has an inverted pyramid you know, where they're, they're thinking um, more broadly about, um, you know, putting more of that tier two, tier three um, approach into that tier one, you know, bringing some of the learning, especially around social emotional stuff, more into that tier one experience. There's also one where they're two core, I saw a state one where they're two corresponding MTSS pyramids, one for, for teachers and one for students where they're thinking about the mental go. health and what kinds of tiers of support that the, the teachers themselves will need 
um, particularly as they address different communities of students that have um, different levels of need. And some of them, as we all know, are having difficulties at home and everything else. Yeah. And knowing what it li is like to take on that kind of emotion every day as a teacher is, 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 is quite, a, quite an experience. So um, for you, uh, Lindsay, you know, is your model a lot different from New Jersey's model? I mean, as you kind of heard it played out by, um, by Ashley, or is it fairly similar? I would say there are certainly a lot of similarities between the two of them. Um, you know, when we first started, we really thought that the majority of our tutors would come from our higher education, from our college students that we had. And that wasn't what we found. In fact, um, probably 75% of them are currently licensed teachers. So tutoring um, is done after school and after school programs instead of during the school day. Um, there is some, so then this year we piloted out an Ed Rising tutoring program, so it allowed high school students um, in those Ed Rising clubs to have a chance to provide tutoring within their district, and so that's done during the classroom time or during the day, and that's worked really well. Um, I think with your recruitment question at the beginning, you know, we first started by contacting schools and saying, hey, we're starting ATC. There was a lot of social media push. There was a lot of memos that went out um, and we were having a lot of boots on the ground. And that was the nice thing about having six of us in different areas is that we were all able to kind of we've already built those relationships. And so going in, I will say now our recruitment is the program itself. I don't think we've done a social media push to recruit tutors in um, in quite some time, but we're still growing every single month. So it's just kind of the success of the program has started that. Um, in training stuff, we also focus on that social emotional piece that Ashley talked about as well. So there are some training modules that our tutors complete um, in social emotional as well as what their content is. But everything was pretty much right on board with the same things that we've experienced as well. It's interesting. Um, I'll have to. I think I told you uh, recently that I'll send you the. Uh, the case study that was passed out at the Accelerate Conference last week. So we did some work shopping on three states, Arkansas, Tennessee, and Texas. Um, and what I remember talking to, you, you know, your team in the beginning of the ESSER dollars and what we found really powerful and pretty innovative is that you just said, look, we understand that the hardest part is going to be staffing. You know, if, if and so we're just going to focus on that. We're going to build. We're going to build this 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 huge army of tutors. And we'll figure out the rest when we can. And so, I think um, you know, I was the voice at the table that said that actually, you know, in all of the chaos of the beginning of all of this, that ended up being a pretty smart idea because that the folks that didn't focus on that in the beginning are now really trying to fill those gaps. So, can you talk about like, do you remember that decision making? rubric like do you, do you remember thinking about that about which part like just you know focusing more on the staffing in the beginning like thinking about getting the tutors in the door early that's where you know we kind of we went with what we had available and who was interested and the majority of them since they are already in a school on a contract yeah that kind of came naturally that way. We do help with some tutor placement, but I would say the majority of all of our tutors already have a school identified okay. um, that they're going to work with. And so we haven't had to spend a whole lot of time on making sure we're in specific places. Right now, there's so much need for tutoring and students that need services that we've just been able to kind of let them go where where they where they want to go or where they need to go. And so, and Ashley, can you talk a little bit about staffing and how with us, I know that right now you've got this huge um, focus on the summer program, and this the summer program kind of like is like the highlight, of, you know, of your resourcing. Um, you know, within this context of like a lot of tutoring programs, there's like that benefit of the university students being at the universities. They're sort of engaged in school, and they they might even look at this kind of as a work study opportunity or something. You know, it's civic in nature, and maybe as a future teacher, it's something that they can do that will help them become a better teacher. Um, but how do you think about staffing during the summer? How different is that than during the school year? Yeah, I uh, kind of building off Lindsay, we have a lot more certified teachers in the summer. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think that's just the nature of oh, I see. Okay. nationally. Uh, 
teachers need more money. And if we're like comparable to all the work that they actually do, right, not just instruction, that is how many people have been uh, piecing it together, whether it be after school or summer kind of professional opportunities. So for us, um, I think systems wise, game changer was having uh, this partner in career plug, it's it's clunky and frustrating, but it's get, getting us more applicants than we were ever able to get when we were actually a part of a university. And so like that was, that's been huge for us just in um, scale. From a, like a recruitment standpoint, um, we're in a mix, same mix as what Lindsay was describing as well. We, we started out with like 60% pre-service educators and now it's kind of evening out depending on the geographic location that we're in. Um, and I think that's a testament to kind of the changing times, right? So hopefully later, I think we are talking about how tutoring, like systemically, what does that look like moving down the road? Like our vision and, and like my deep passion is that these tutoring efforts are also sustainable um, pipeline programs for the future educators in our workforce, right? The amount of time I spend talking with superintendents, curriculum and instruction folks, HR, you know, all these district people, to get us on board and in a district, if my tutors, as they're gaining great experience and building all these relationships, which are so paramount to the success of the tutoring program, um, if they aren't earning, like toward uh, making progress on their pathway to certification in some capacity, then those you know years, months of that partnership didn't ultimately benefit the district as much as it could have. Yeah. And so that is also the way we look at it is like, there are people out there that maybe didn't consider teaching. There are people that stopped. It wasn't for them. There are people that have been working in schools and have never been able to make it over, you know, the finish line for a certification. And then we've got people that have left and become full-time tutors, right? And so they're all in our mix. And so how do we, um, and alumni of some of our school partners that are like, we want to tap into those people and bring them back. Can they work for you? And like, absolutely. Do you want, like, let's figure out how we get them certified, right? And like, make sure that happens at the same time. So it is not innate in the state of New Jersey right now to have the tutoring activities and work count towards those credits. And, you know, I'm working at everything within my power to make sure that we're not duplicating and making it harder for people to become teachers in the state while they're also, you know, closing these learning gaps for kids. Yeah, yesterday um, we held a, um, Deans for Impact came to Richmond and held a really, um, fascinating a sort of policy discussion with a bunch of leadership from across the state. Um, and, you know, a lot of what we did and workshop was just thinking about where the opportunities are in policy. Um, you know, a policy that is like that tutors need to be paid and they need to pay, be paid well, you know, which establishes, you know, this establishes this idea also that as a future educator, you can make a living, hopefully at some point as a, as a teacher, you know, we want to change some of that stigma and that we hope that tutoring can. And I think that there was another piece that you spoke to a bit, which is um, I'd love to see some universal credentialing that is transferable, right? So if you've learned, really learned how to leverage certain, like leverage iReady, you know, or you've really learned how to, um, you know, use a structured literacy approach to help, you know, third and fourth graders, you know, having a badge or something that you can carry along with you, no matter where you go, that that's an experience that you've had and, and some training that you've had, I think could be really, could be really powerful. So I'm, I'm, ex I'm excited to see where that can go. Um, uh, going back to you, Lindsay, can you talk a bit more about um, the expectations the core has around reporting? I mean, I know this is a big, everybody's talking about disparate data and how to collect the data. I've, I've, I've been on two hour calls about nothing but attendance, right? Nobody's, ever, they're not even thinking about other kinds of data. They're just thinking about how hard it is to collect attendance. Can you talk a little bit about that and how you're thinking about proving efficacy? Yes. Yeah, so the data piece is the one thing that if you said, Lindsay, what would you go back and change from the very beginning? that would be where I can identify as our weakness was at. Um, and now I can kind of see where it needs to go. Our governor recently passed the Learns Act that will designate funding towards tutoring with this whole new set of rules. And so we'll have to revamp our program to focus more from the training piece, which is what we initially started as, as to more of a student um, improvement and tracking and scores. Right now, our program is designed into like training levels, and those levels have a certain number of tutoring hours within them. 
But we do ask our tutors at the end of each level, they complete a short survey. And um, so we're tracking um, how many students they're tutoring in a session. So our tutoring core calls for individual or small group tutoring. So we're tracking that. We're tracking what districts that they're currently tutoring in, um, as well as what success and how they're measuring that success, whether it's iReady or MAP scores, um, fluency increase, um, et cetera. And then we're also tracking um, added, the student's attitude or approach towards tutoring and learning. And so that's been kind of neat to see that students are getting a more positive outcome on tackling things that they don't know. And so we're targeting that as well, as well as celebrations um, and overall growth is what we're currently looking at. It's really interesting because I heard um, yesterday I was talking to a program director who said that she had been working with NWEA, um, you know, getting those that map. They were doing they had a license with NWEA, so they were using map to do some assessment. Um, the piece that was always missing, and I think that they finally created a partnership with an NWA to do this, was that counterpoint of the academic growth of the students that weren't being tutoring, but won't, weren't being tutored within the, that district. Because it's one thing to sort of have your own data. Here's your cohort of students. Here's what MAP is saying about the progress of those students. It's quite another thing to have that and to be able to juxtapose that with um, you know, this, this, the population that's not getting tutoring. So I am seeing some more and more openness to try to think about pulling all that data into one place and make it easier to understand you know, what's working and what's not working. So Ashley, I'd just love to have the same question asked of you. I know you are a, a data nerd just like me and <laughs> sure Lindsay is too, but I'd love to just hear about how things were in the beginning, you know, and, and going through and how you've kind of evolved your thought process around around data. Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, airing the dirty laundry, I think at the beginning, the biggest challenge was nothing. There was no off the shelf, easy solution, right, to to do what we were tasked to do. So we were working in the summertime, which is a, already a shorter period of time. And not with partners that that run schools, right? It's a, a camp kind of base atmosphere. So we started out um, paper-based assessments uh, with a high quality, you know, vetted by um, Ed Reports, you know, great math curriculum, but all paper-based. So, you know, now full circle, we are furthest from paper-based as possible. And I think that's just, you know, when I see a ch my, one of my children come home with a paper-based assessment, I'm like, how does this still happen today? <laughs> so that's the root of my like data leaning. Um, now, you know, we've we've gone all in and invested with iReady because in New Jersey, two things. Um, one, they have a linking study that directly connects to NJSLA and the NJ um, state standards that that you know, has some projections that say, here's where they are based on their baseline data. How could they perform on NJSLA? That's really helpful because most of the time, most often our school partners are saying, we're going to support these kids because we're also seeing in our NJSLA data, they're not proficient, right? And so it matches there where now we just need to break it down one more level and say, well, what are the areas in which in math and in ELA that this student has you know, hasn't, has been struggling with? What are those foundational skills that are missing? So if you haven't ever worked with iReady before, something that I, I love about it is that the domains are easy um, to understand. They also then break down each of those domains into like skill-based lessons that regardless of the tutors we recruit, if you've never stepped foot in a classroom, um, if you've been a teacher for 20 years, it's, it's very easy to be targeted in your instruction based on those students' needs. Um, kind of zooming out from a larger data perspective, like this is why we're excited to work with Pearl. I know, you know, people on this call may have already started. We're, we're piloting with them this summer so that we can better see all of our data in one place. So I think the other side of, of data isn't just the student assessment data. It is how do we show our programs efficacy without um, having 10 systems, right? Without dying in Google Sheets, which has been my life. And then also, um, you know, easy to report to all the different audiences that want to, you know, share in our success. So I think those are, they're both pain points and like data use cases that haven't necessarily been solved for yet. Um, but, you know, for us, big picture, when we, when we look at our program, we talk about quantitative and qualitative data. Our qualitative data is all survey data from our scholars, from our staff, from our partners. Um, and then that qualitative, quantitative data is coming from the progress and growth on the iReady assessment. 
Yeah, that's so interesting. So I, I'd love to just talk a bit more about I'm, I'm, I, I, you and I have had this discussion in the past, but I want to see if I can ask the question in a better way. So across your program, you are like, for instance, in this this summer, what is the, you, you, are you in just community centers and, or are you in community centers and in schools? We're in both this summer. Okay. So um, 20 uh, boys and girls club and YMCA summer camps. Got it. And then, uh, to New York public schools and pending, you know, a signed contract to other Camden uh, charter schools. And with those schools specifically, um, do those, do you know if those schools are using iReady as their core curriculum or not? That is the challenge. Sometimes they are and sometimes they're not. And okay. so go ahead. No, I, yeah, because I'm, this is, this is one of those like things that I think continues to be a mystery for folks when they when they think about programs like both of yours where you're covering this large swath of districts and or students who are in different districts whether you're teaching them in that district or not and they're maybe just coming for a summer camp for an intervention but for you to show academic progress it necessitates that you normalize the assessment approach across that entire program but that's meaningful as alignment with core curriculum if the school is using iReady and doesn't mean it's not additive across the board, but how do you think about that strange juxtaposition of like those two different approaches? Uh, the short answer is it's really hard. I think the way we're viewing it when we're working in, with school partners that have other assessment or curricular models, it's another piece of data. What we haven't solved for and we're looking to solve for this upcoming school year is how do we have more of a, a portfolio approach, right, with student data, um, because that also speaks to the whole child, right, and MTSS at large, where if we're really just focusing on, you know, a fourth grader that hasn't tested out of phonics, like, what else is going on there, right? Are there other, other things that could be happening? Um, and schools have that data, right? But um, that isn't always just captured in an assessment. For our community partners, I think the nature, and when we talk with iReady, they'll tell you over and over again, like it's really hard to squeeze a summer program and 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 validity of an assessment in that short period of time. Yeah. However, like the 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 dosage, right, and the time that we're working with scholars extrapolates to being similar to almost half a school year, right? Because of the like how frequently we're in there. And so um, that's what makes us comfortable and still using the assessment, but it still takes time, right? And we still have fidelity issues. Like if you don't have that culture of assessment, like with those students or your staff have never used an adaptive tool before. I mean, those are some of those like real challenges. So I, people that are on, on this webinar that like fund programs, but don't understand like the tools in which we have to use to prove our effectiveness, like that would be like the biggest gap that we could also fill because it is, it's so challenging. And I think the sooner we solve that challenge to making sure there's more data warehousing abilities, using state standard, right? Like making it easier and not on the backs of children that we're proving that the support is working is that that would be my big goal. <laughs> yeah. And I'd love to hear your, um, your thoughts on that. Um, uh, Ash, all right, Lindsay, sorry. I'd love to just hear how you're thinking about that. How are you thinking about assessments and yeah, I mean, we're in the same thing. So we're currently, we have tutors that are tutoring students from 66 different school districts mm -hmm. um, that we've been able to track. And so I don't know if there's really a way to make everyone use the same assessment if the assessment is not lining up with the curriculum or the training piece that they're doing. And so that's been one of our biggest obstacles is trying to line up an assessment that, yes, as Ashley mentioned, that everyone can be used and that's user friendly so that we're not spending our entire time in tech support because um, that's not beneficial either. And um, so finding that assessment piece that links to the training, that links to the curriculum, that links to where the students needs are at that very point um, is a big hurdle to overcome. Um, it's something, though, that we have to do. We have to make sure that our students are getting the learning that they're needing, that they're making the strides that they need to, that our tutors are able to adjust their approach and their instruction with that student to meet their needs. And so we're currently looking at that now. Um, 
The only tutors that we require to use an assessment is our Ed Rising, our high school tutors that are tutoring students, and they do a pre, a mid, and an end of the year assessment. Um, and that's worked really well. But there's also a difference between having a high school student who's already well versed in technology learn that tool versus some of our tutors who um, we have some that are just general community. We have some that are retired teachers that are tutoring. And, you know, it's been a while since they've been in assessments. Or if you have someone coming in that's doing tutoring that is not working in the field of education or college students whose major is not education, it's been really kind of difficult because you have to go back and teach why these assessments are the way they are and how they're being used and then being able to read that data in order to make changes. Um, it is something to really really focus some time on. Yeah, it's really one of the most complicated issues that I deal with across. I mean, you know, we're helping 20, 30 different programs and um, big programs, and each one of them sort of has their own. It's like almost like a puzzle to figure out when it comes to assessment, because ultimately, I, you know, I think of that individualized learning experience as such an opportunity for the student, but it's also such an opportunity for the teacher that that student for like New Jersey, right? It's a, such an opportunity for that teacher that the student will that will be um, helping that student in the new school year, right? Like what what did they learn this summer? What are the gaps in learning that I'm I'm seeing in my system today that might have been mitigated over the summer, you know? Or what are some things that have been identified that could help me better teach this student? especially in that context of I'm a teacher and I'm sitting in front of 20 or 30 students and 15 of them have IEPs. You know, this is the reality some of some of our um, some of our teachers. And so what they are lacking, although there's there's this all of this data, you know, being able to distill that data down and understand how that could be helpful from student to student is just. Yeah. So we've got a lot of questions coming in. So I want to get to our last question here before we get to Q&A, because it's just like they're coming in like crazy. Um, as a traditionalist webinar, I'd love to just peer into the future a bit and talk a little bit about um, where we're headed. You know, I recently attended the ASU GSV conference in San Diego and Accelerate Community of Practice last week. And then next week, going out to Palo Alto for this conference at Stanford, the High Impact Tutoring Conference. And, you know, everyone is talking about evidence, right? We're talking about like the programs that are going to be made sustainable past this cliff that all of us are sort of thinking about this ominous cliff are going to be the ones that have some enough proof points or have big dug their heels in enough to sort of um, to, to continue and, and garner the kinds of attention that funders need and have proven that they can actually collect this, the ROI metrics that funders want to see to ensure that there's going to be for them long term a return on their um their in, their investment or their funding. So Ashley I want to start with you. Love to hear you scope things out. I'm happy to also if you want to dive into where chat gpt or any of those things might be part of it. Go crazy. It's all it's up to you. No, no. I don't uh I should care more about chat gpt honestly before I you know become a dinosaur but um <laughs> I think honestly three things for the future of like of this work. I think ultimately for its long-term like sustainable success, it needs to be embedded within districts because the, the systems and structures of high quality implementation around tutoring are already there, right? There are built-in instructional coaches. They have their, um, they should have high quality curriculum and assessment, right? Aligned to those state standards. They already have some of these systems for identifying students and providing those interventions. I think what they don't have is what we're trying to help with, and, and that's the added people capacity. Um, we are helping them finagle funding and funding. We are helping and bringing more funding to the table, as well as like an option to rearrange the way they are funding people-driven programs in their district, um, because we're hired as a, as a contractor, right? And, and we're helping them, which allows them to alleviate some of the the more expensive costs of hiring people to, to support scholars. Um, I think also long-term why, how this is really gonna be sustainable and stick is that it has to yield more than just short-term academic gains for students, even though that is why we're all in, in this work, right? Is to close and support our scholars. But at the end of the day, the system at large needs more educators. And so if we're investing all this time and energy, like I was sharing before, like our method around staffing and recruitment is also to increase that pipeline and supply of teachers. 
um, the demand, like by and large, this tutoring work is, is perfect for apprenticeship programs and, and rethinking how we actually train the future of our profession. Not to mention, I don't even, I'm dating myself. I don't even know what the like latest term for the most recent generation is, but like them, they are not looking for 40 years and a pension in education, right? And yet all of our systems are designed to compensate, right? And attract people into that line of work with very rigid schedules, um, not no flexibility when you eventually have children, if you choose to have children, and ultimately, you know, zero competitive pay, but yet with this, um, you know, the expectation of deeply pers- like um, specialized credentials. So, you know, here I am with a master's degree and undergraduate and all of these other things. And if I had stayed in my classroom and taught in middle school, ELA and social studies, I think I was at five years in, you know, $65,000 and that's good, right? Um, yeah. Like relatively speaking, but my peers with sim- similar credentials and like knowledge experience and like professional opportunities were already well above hundred K. And so like now it's a financial decision for someone's future, right? Like, am I going to be able to, to live the kind of life I want to live financially and support my family and those kind of things by staying in teaching? So Tutoring can help with all of those things. I think it's connecting the dots and making sure that we aren't afraid to kind of rethink some of our systems and structures. Absolutely. I mean, I think there, and, and, you know, there has to be room for innovation when it comes to policy and pay and all of that. And if tutoring is going to become more a, you know, woven into the fabric of the K-12 experience, which I believe it really should be, um, that's a different kind of resource paradigm. And, you know, we're going to have to think about how we fund that. And particularly if it necessitates very specialized kinds of teachers or tutors, right? So, and I do think that there's an opportunity for, you know, AI and other tools to help scaffold that a bit, but we're still going to need people who have that emotional intelligence. The kids who need it the most are not going to go to chat GPT-4 and start looking for answers. Like That's exactly they need right. a person who believes in them. So, um, that's awesome. So, Lindsay, I'd like to kind of ask the same question of you. So, how are you thinking about the the future from your chair? Yeah, and the same thing with the funding piece. You know, you can't really expect for the funding to come from a school district's budget as it stands right now without some extra support from state department, um, grants, et cetera. So that piece, and those are becoming more readily accessible. That we found there's more um, attention being given to that is one thing I think there's going to be a really big push for literacy tutoring starting in pre-K. I think that's a big area that we need to start targeting into and then also expanding up into high school subjects. So we're looking at doing some 9-12 tutoring in addition to our K-8. And then I couldn't agree with Ashley more and I had that on my list as well for my hopes for the future is that tutoring core and tutoring in general can really bring if it's not going to recruit into our profession, that we can at least bring an awareness of the field of education and positively impact um, that recruitment and the retention piece. So those would be my my hopes for the future. Maybe it's more of my hopes than what I see happening, but that's what I really kind of think the direction that we're headed in. That's great. That's great. All right. Well, we have a bunch of questions, so let's just dive into some of these. Um, so Ashley, I think this might be a quick one. And you, Pocket, talk a little bit about um, teaching. Are you doing teaching during the day, um, the school during the school day? I know you're doing that now. Can you talk a little bit about like what you're doing currently during the school year, as opposed to what's happening during the summer? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we have an, during the school year we have embedded school day and after school models. During the summertime, it is pushing into summer camps. So right now, this is our last week of an, our embedded school day. We had um, seven partners across 19 locations. Of those seven partners, we had two fully embedded, nine to three. Two decided they wanted to do um, afternoon embedded and flow into after school. And then the last three, I got to, they, the rest wanted after school only. Um, and that was largely because I would be remiss if I mentioned like we, the tutoring corps left the College of New Jersey in November of 2022. So it is 
May of 2023, and we were standing on our own two feet eight short months ago, six short months ago. So um, the pilot was very quick to get into those districts and help them think through how do we, and you know, how do we structure these kind of partnerships. So for next year, um, same thing is going to be taking place in a lot of those same locations and then adding on a handful more. Um, something else we're really excited about is uh, we're participating in the personalized learning initiative across the country to kind of look into these sustainable school-based models. So in some of those locations that we're working, how do we make sure that high dosage and then this like mixture of maybe some ed tech solution with high dosage tutoring to make it longer term sustainable for that district to continue? So I have a quick question. So I, and this is something just I've been thinking a lot about. So in a normal sort of tutoring, I don't want to call it intervention. Let's just call it like a tutoring a student is determined to need tutoring, right? And someone may need just tier three support ongoing, right? Yeah. But if you think about, okay, this kid's going to get uh, an, a, a semester experience of early literacy, hopefully that'll mitigate some of the gaps that we've identified that that student has and sort of the basics of literacy. Okay. How, what's the dose, how does the dosage compare like for a semester, I think you, I heard you say that a summer, because if it's more intense, more intensive, that they are about the same. Can you talk a little bit about the difference in dosage? And if the diff, if there's a differentiation in dosage, is there a slightly different approach so that you get a higher impact during the summer? Sure. Um, so, well, summertime is eight weeks. Our school year model, our, our fall and a spring block, ideally this year, we just had the spring block okay. of 12 to 15 weeks. So if we're going end to end inclus inclusive of training of our staff and then rolling things out and then the wrap up of programming, it's it's closer to 15 weeks. So already there's more time just baked in during the school year in that fall or spring block. Um, when it comes to dosage, that's what's tricky. Like we say at a bare minimum, it needs to be two times a week for a content area because often what we're seeing is that people, students need math and literacy and therefore we end up going four times. Or they own, or their time, the amount of time during that school schedule, the intervention block that they created, um, necessitates how much they're able to get for each for each content area. Um, so for summer, we by and large sometimes with locations and, and summer camp schedules that we say, fine, you're going to need to pick one content area, right? So we can really hit that content area home. Um, or if you're doing both, but you have enough time built into your schedule. We're going to make sure that it's almost, you know, every day, but it's 30 minutes. So it's like smaller bits of time. Um, I think that's large. Yeah, and, it's like, is it, and one last, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just really curious about this. So the, the camp experience, is it a camp experience? Like, am I going and mm -hmm. playing basketball for an hour? Oh, yeah. Just, and then we're stealing you from swimming and yeah. hopefully you don't get okay. angry about it. Yeah. yeah so, <laughs> so attendance is kind of similar. Like they, they're expected to go to camp, like they're expected to go to school. So in some ways, there's that still sort of, there's that, that incentive to be there that's beyond just the tutoring that drives attendance in the same way it would if they were in the school environment. Yeah, I would say the only downfall with attendance in the summer is when people are on vacation, right? Or like some camps have rotating weeks mm -hmm. where it could be like any six versus the full eight or, you know, those are some of the rubs, but at the end of the day, we know like we're able to do what you were saying earlier. We're able to to close some of the gaps, prevent some of the slide happening that summer, and better equip that student, you know, to head into third grade, fourth grade, seventh grade, you name it. Awesome. So, Lindsay, I got a question for you um, from the audience. Are there any other best practices we're sharing from your experience with tutor training? Would you recommend following a regimented schedule of lesson plans for tutor training the same way we do, same way we do in tutoring? It's not sure. So thinking about tutor training, I guess just speak to tutor training in general, like what approach you use. It sounds like you've developed some of your own modules. Yeah. So like our state has um, tutor training modules that are available that are outside of a curriculum training. And so we just kind of went through and identified those um, looking at that list, talking with our Arkansas ideas people on what training modules they would suggest, talking with our co-op specialists on what they would suggest and putting that together. Um, I was really looking at your question about the regimented schedule of lesson plans and tutor training the same way. You know, that's a really difficult one. And Ashley may need to help 
chime in on this one as well, but you know, every student's needs are in a different place. And I found that every tutor that's tutoring students, because ours are all done in person, I'd say 99.9% .9 of all of our tutoring is done in person. Um, those tutors are in different places too. So I think, you know, even with our Ed Rising and Arkansas High School students, I've had some of them ask that they can be an additional training. Other things, other ones are like, we don't need this much training. And I'm like, well, you still have to do the training modules no matter what. Um, and it's the same thing with our tutors. You know, we put them through the training modules because currently we're working underneath that legislative act that says we're a training, a tutor training program. Um, but we're not requiring them to use that training in their tutoring sessions. They can use whatever the district is asking. And so I really kind of feel like that one is more of a looking at the tutor as an individual and looking at the students that they're serving as an individual piece. If you have students that you can completely identify exactly where their needs are, then the training pieces are going to directly apply in. But when you're having tutors complete training that doesn't apply to those student needs necessarily, is that a waste, a waste of time on both the tutor part and on the person that's providing the training on the tutoring core as well? So uh, Ashley, do you have anything to add on that one? Uh, happy to echo, you're so right, right? Like the tutors are all across the spectrum. And so that like one size fits all training module model is, is not as helpful, although that's where we start. I think we added instructional coaches and that has helped for us where, um, we essentially took the Danielson framework for instruction and for teachers, and we uh, prioritized three, uh, three or four of the domains and said, this is what we expect, right, as professionals working with, with students. So our instructional coaches use that, our, our tutors kind of do their own self-assessment. Here's where I see myself, um, you know, against this framework. But this past year, we piloted the, um, I don't know if you guys did that too, Lindsay, the modules out of Deans for Impact. They're only for math. We're working with that team to, to share the feedback from all of our staff. But I think one thing that I took away from the modules that and that pilot was everyone needs, we need to make sure that everyone knows, like, use high quality instructional materials, and this is what they look like. Right. So there's some foundational things. We, we do additional social justice training and SEL training, because again, I think that the mindset of the tutor is something we can instill and say, here's what we expect when you work for us, having an asset-based language not deficit. Um, we start off all of our sessions with, uh, we use the zones for regulation, like little check-ins. So some of those things you can, you know, like are universal, but exactly like Lindsay was saying, it is so hard when you've got veteran, awesome teachers and you're like, great, go do your thing. Like you're, you have been cultivating that for years. And then I've got maybe a pre-service educator who I'm like, we are going to hold your hand <laughs> and like a little bit more direct oversight. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's where we're seeing some really interesting. I've got a group um, in Cincinnati that I've been helping out just consultatively that's got a peer to peer group. It was a high school student, really smart high school student. She happens to be headed to Brown uh, for, for college next year. So she's super excited about that good place for her considering what she's been working on. Um, but, you know, they just use high school students and it's really just mentorship, right? I mean, it's academic mentorship. Um, and just using high quality materials, you can really, you can build some, some supports there. I, um, you know, I have a conversation queued up with Tracy at Deans for Impact for next week, where we're going to talk a bit more about where, you know, where some kind of um, refined, more light version of their modules might be available at some point. So if you've got, you know, retired teachers that haven't taught for a while, and maybe they just need to sort of have some reminders of some certain things and or be more um, aware of how this generation learns a little bit differently, maybe than the generation that they they taught. Um, I think that those kinds of things could be really helpful. Um, let's see here. I got. Let's do one more question. Um, all right. Let's see. Ashley, you mentioned the challenge of incorporating technology into teaching plans. Do you provide approved vendor service providers for tutors to leverage, or can they use whatever they're comfortable with? I think we talked about that a little bit, but maybe you can go a little deeper. Yeah, we, um, well, and this is going to be a part of the, the study that we're doing with the Personalized Learning Initiative. Um, right now, what we do because of our partnership with iReady is they have a MyPath kind of module-based <coughs> personalized instruction. So in uh, one example from this past year, uh, a partner came on board and a district said, listen, 
it has to be after school because that's what we've got right now. But we have 70 kids and only an hour, four days a week. I'm like, when you do the math and you rough that out, I'm like, you want to serve both content areas. Here's the, uh, eventually what it became is we put students on their MyPath for about 25, 30 minutes, which all these individualized modules based on their baseline data so that they could, you know, close some of that learning that way and then flip right over to direct instruction and then vice versa. Yeah. So when it, when people work with us, yes, we, if they're going to do as a part of the design of the program, it is through the, the technology through iReady. Um, if a school district was already using some sort of um, a tech solution around personalized instruction that was aligned to their curriculum or the state standards, I think that's what we would then incorporate as well. With regards to just like general technology use and for instruction, I was a huge fan when I was in the classroom. You know, I loved finding different, whether they were video clips or, you know, leveraging different databases filled with those kind of resources there's enough time typically, right? Because we're really asking people to focus on those foundational skills. Um, and so if there is something great that they found and they use it, it's normally for like maybe one minute, two minutes, it could be an intro, a, you know, an exit ticket or something. Um, but but we're, we give them the autonomy to, to make those choices. Interesting. So Lindsay, is it sort of the same, you have the same perspective on that or is it differentiated in any other way? I don't know if I could add anything more to what Ashley said, except for I, I mean, I completely agree with exactly what you just outlined there. Yeah, it's interesting. So I think that there, what I've seen is that, you know, you, and one of the questions that's here, I think I'll kind of speak to, you know, what we're seeing is this interesting stack of resources. You have your certified teachers that are already in the school. You have your, um, your pair pros, right? You have your retired teachers who have been teaching for years and they have all that experience. You have your university, um, sometimes graduate students who can, there's a, comes a lot of conversation about those folks, not only being tutors, but potentially being almost like a professional development layer um, that can kind of serve as um, tutor mentors. Um, we heard some really interesting ideas um, that are going on in both Baltimore schools and DC schools at the conference last week, which, you know, included, you know, having a high impact tutoring dedicated individual at, at each school, someone who's just really overseeing tutoring and coordinating tutoring within the school. So I know there's a lot of innovation there and people are thinking about how to make sure that if the funding does exist, that the resources to um, make sure those tutoring programs can be successful are made available. So I really appreciate both of you so very much for your time. I know you're both incredibly busy. Um, I think I'm going to see, am I going to see, I know I'm going to see you next week. All right. But no. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, that's right. You told me that yesterday. All right. Well, um, as is always the case, we're going to make these, this video available to folks. If you have friends or colleagues that have missed it and would like to check it out, please send them the link. Um, if you have any additional questions, let us know. And as is always the case, if you're looking for the, you know, the consulting side, the scaffolding side for these types of programs, or if you're looking for a platform that can help you collect the data to prove efficacy and make those your programs sustainable, um, World Pearl is a great solution for that. So we appreciate very much your time and thanks to Lindsay and Ashley for participating in today's webinar.